Hey, glad you could stop by. Today I'm making Buva Shankle and I cannot wait to show you how to do this recipe. Right here I'm mixing the important flavor ingredient and on the stove I have a beef roast and broth cooking to get hot because it has to be at the prime heat to cook this or it's going to be a soggy mess. Anyway, let me tell you about Buvashenkel. Buvashenkel in Amish terminology means a boy's legs. I don't know why their language refers to Buva instead of Yunga as boy, and I do believe it's because of where they come from. Anyway, I grew up with them always talking Buva instead of Yunga. And then when I got older and met people straight from Germany, they would use Yunga. Anyway, I adapted this recipe to fit the modern kitchen because um, when I've had dishes like this, of course, I lived on a farm. You go out to the chicken house, you grab the eggs. Uh, you may have rendered the lard when you butchered the hog the fall before, and the taters have come directly out of the garden. Things like that. Fresh parsley. You had everything fresh, and that's the appeal of Amish recipes. I do believe the reason people love them so much is because the ingredients are fresh, and they are full of flavor and nutrients, everything you miss out on when you have to buy them from the store. However, because I no longer live on a farm, I'm going to have to show you a modern way of doing it. But anyway, you caught me in the middle of making a filling. What happens is I make a pastry, which I will show you how to do, a filling, and on the stove I have a beef roast. Now you take a roast about one and a half to two pounds and cook it in water on the stove and then Dutch oven, of course. Not Pennsylvania Dutch, just Dutch oven. Until it's tender and it makes a broth. Then you take the beef out, slice it up, cut it up in chunks, however you want to eat it, and put it back in the broth. Now, currently the broth is rewarming to boiling because I had to cool it enough to handle it. I didn't want to entertain you with my antiques of getting burned. Anyway, so I've made the pastry and now I'm making the filling that will go in the pastry or shankle which they call it for the boys legs anyway let me get back to it let me get back to it the filling here I have I cooked a bunch of taters down about six of them and when I mashed them up it made about two and a half cups of taters it'll vary a little and the exact it's it's not important to be exact you show me a cook from the country that's exact and I'll show you one that's faking it Anyway, about two and a half cups, cups <laughs> mashed taters. Uh, because I don't have fresh parsley, unfortunately, I used a tablespoon of dried parsley flakes. If you have fresh parsley, you know, put a tablespoon or two in there, but you know, like I say, this is town, we have to improvise. I put a, roughly a teaspoon of salt. I start with a half teaspoon in the recipe and then go up by flavor because it depends on your taters. If you get two and a half cups, you know, it might be too much to have a teaspoon. And then I mashed that all around and mixed it. Then I cooked um, some onion, about half a cup onion chopped up in a, in a half cup butter, or excuse me, fourth cup butter. I'm getting ahead of myself and mix that into here. Now the only thing left is the three eggs. And I beat those up a little bit beforehand. I really wished I had farm eggs because the difference is just spectacular. Farm eggs are really, really yellow. Now these are considered uh, free range, so they're a little more yellow than your cage, cage eggs, whatever you call them. And you just mix that in and until it's just kind of um, like a creamy whipped tater almost. And just stir it around. Now I'm not going to add any flour or anything to it because when these cook, they will become the filling. I think they resemble pierogies, if that's how you say it. I'm not sure that is how you say it, but anyway, we're going to mix that and set that aside. Oh, I used to dig a lot of taters on the farm, and I can tell you, when they're fresh out of the garden and you cook them, oh, amazing. Anyway, put that aside. For my pastry, that's two and a half cups flour, a half cup shortening. Now, if you want to make it the Amish way, you will use lard. And we used to make our own lard. I, of course, don't have a farm now. I can't render lard. 
I don't even want to buy the lard because the lard in the store is just, it's just nasty stuff. So I used a Crisco type, which I really hate to have to resort to, but I did. And then I put a teaspoon of salt in there. And again, like anything else, I tell you, you can just salt to your uh, personal taste. But a teaspoon makes it just about right, in my opinion. Okay, then I cut that up, mix it in. Now, the shortening, you need to use like two knives or a pastry, one of those things that cuts it in, until it's like a pie crumbly dough. And then you start adding cold water a little bit at a time until you get the dough like this. It's not sticky. You can handle it, but yet it's not dry either. It sticks together like that. All right, so now I'm going to show you what to do with it. We're going to put this into two pieces. You can put it into two or four. Usually it's two, but I have such limited space I consider doing it in four. And then we're going to turn it into a circle, and then we're going to roll it out, and I'll show you what to do next. And like I mentioned before, I have the roast warming up in the broth again, because it really does have to be boiling to make this a success. I can see it going crazy over there. <laughs> okay. You don't want to get too crazy with the flour, because it'll be dry, but you want it, you know... So don't stick to your countertop. And just roll it out. About an eighth an inch thick, approximately. And if you try the recipe a few times, you might find you want it different thicknesses. I was looking at the new rolling pins at the store the other day. Man, they have come a long way in technology. I've also used all kinds of stuff as rolling pins when I didn't have one. I'm going to try to make this a circle. I never have good luck making a perfect circle unless I actually make a template and put it over it and cut it out. I was going to tell you an Amish joke, but if you went and translated it, you would find out why I would say it in German and not in uh, English. Anyhow, I decided against it. Oh, that's good enough. I'm going to make two. Like I say, if you want to get fancy, you can cut it, but I don't like to waste anything. Okay, I'm going to choose what's going to be the half mark. You're just going to spoon that filling on there. I know it's not very pretty right now. And some of these foods aren't colorful. The parsley gives it a little color, but it's the flavor, you know? All right, I'm just gonna make one for the film right now. You're not gonna have to see me do it all. Now, when you see it's folded over, you wanna try to get it all in there. And I got a little bit of water here in a dish. If you wet the edges, it sticks together much better. And I will trim up the dough a bit at this point. If I was just making this without the film, I'll be honest, it'll just go anyway. Because we eat it anyhow. And you can always make a little patch when necessary. And I'm doing that to kind of show you how to do it. Okay, you see it's like a huge pocket. Then we're going to take, oops, take our fork and mush down the edges. Of course, I always have some escape. You're not supposed to, but I just never have luck with that. Filling cookies, the same thing. Mess, mess, mess. All right. Now, it's hard for me to picture the, um, the cooking under here. I realize the steam's a problem. So I'm going to lift this up and take it over to the boiling broth and come back and tell you a little more about the recipe. You want to be careful so you don't break it. Ooh, that's hot. <coughs> All 
All right, now we're gonna let that cook roughly 30 minutes. It might take a little more, it might take a little less, but usually it takes a little bit more rather than less. Let's put that pastry in there. We're not wasting pastry. But while that cooks, let me tell you what's gonna happen next. After it's done, I'm gonna lay it on a platter and I'm gonna take the beef out and set it aside. The leftover broth, it usually absorbs a bit of it, so we're not gonna have a lot of broth. We're going to thicken with breadcrumbs, and then we're going to put butter and cream in there. Now, why breadcrumbs? I just can't really explain to you why, but a lot of the Amish recipes, they thicken with breadcrumbs instead of flour or cornstarch. They do use those things, but some recipes they don't. Uh, shoe fly pie. It's a crumb-based thickening. Anyway, I will show you how to make shoe fly pie. But I'll join you again when the, when the next step is ready to go and I can show you how to make the gravy. And I may try to cook it here under the camera. I'll try the steam and see what happens. See you in a minute. It's been a roughly 30 minutes. And what you're wanting to check for is that it's not doughy anymore. And if you made these into smaller ones, they're much easier to handle. But we make them big here. Anyway. Put the beef around the edges, and now I'm going to show you the gravy we're going to put on top. I got my cooker warming up. There's not much broth left over. That whole pot was full of broth to start with. But here's some breadcrumbs. And those dry breadcrumbs will absorb some of the liquid. It's not a real smooth gravy, and it has thickened a little bit already because of the flour in the shinkel. Now I'm going to add the cream. This is just the finishing touches. I started it a little bit. It is. I don't look very good, does it? <laughs> I mainly just want to warm it through at the left to give you an idea of what we're doing here. Very hot, so trying to keep the steam down. Okay, that's probably good enough. Like I said I started it a little bit before filming, so you wouldn't have to watch the whole painful process. Now normally you'd sit this on the plate because they're smaller generally and you put that on plate with some of the beef and then you'd spin over some of the gravy. Because I cooked it with the beef there's some um, fine beef pieces on the shinkel and on, you know otherwise you can make it much more attractive. However, like I said, it's all about the flavor. Anyway, I hope you try the recipe and enjoy it and adjust the spices to make it your own. Uh, the recipe will be in my cookbook with all the modernizations and you can try it for yourself. Thank you for stopping by my kitchen.